So hello everyone, it's a great, great joy after intensive week of, of work, uh, of writing emails and being in touch with, uh, the, with different poetic circles around uh, the world to uh, welcome everyone uh, to the opening event of our Festival of Hope. Uh, we, this is Versopolis, it's a platform of international poetry festivals uh, from all around Europe, supported by the European Union. Um, we are close to B30 festivals who collaborate at Versopolis. Uh, what happened to us happened to many, many more uh, poetry festivals and other culture organizers around the world. Uh, namely that events got cancelled or postponed, that organizers are facing um, um, big trouble and big uncertainty whether their programs will go on uh, next year or they will have to shut down. Of course, facing the pandemic, the global pandemic, these are perhaps um, right at that mo at this moment uh, less important questions on the other hand we believe that through culture through the power of uh, the spoken and the written word through poetry we can steer hope and there is nothing more needed than hope i think in this moment i am very glad uh, that three uh, distinguished poets and writers, essayists uh, from around the world join me for this opening conversation. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Sharmista Mohanty uh, from Mumbai, uh, Caroline Forche from Washington DC, and Yang Lian from um, Berlin slash Beijing. You're based now in Berlin, but I know you're commuting a lot between China and and Berlin. Um, I hope, we hope we are starting our emails lately, perhaps even more uh, intensified with this phrase, this phrase which is becoming a, a, a vital, vital one. Uh, I don't want to uh, to ground this conversation only in what is going on around us in the last couple of weeks, but also uh, uh, opening it up to our future. Um, and I would like to start basically with a very basic question uh, to all of you. Um, in times like this, in times of severe crisis, um, how do you, as, as writers, as poets, react? I mean, physically, is it something that creates you work? Or is it something rather that um, uh, makes you stop uh, working, uh, getting into a position of inability, let's say, to, to find words for what is surrounding us and, let's say, just absorbing and, and taking in uh, very unusual circumstances we live in. Charmista, perhaps you would start, like to start. Uh, you know, I would say, Alesh, that it's a bit of both, maybe. It's, um, I have been writing and working, and for me, I think that really keeps me and maybe many of us very sane throughout this time, that we can be in a world which is different than the physical reality that we're going through. But at the same time, there are days when, you know, you read the reports and you just, you can't work because things are just so terrible. And here in India, we've had a lot of additional problems, as you may have read in the papers, that we have a very sizable population of migrant laborers who uh, no longer have jobs or shelters and have been wanting to actually walk home hundreds of miles to the villages that they come from. So it's, 
it's complete catastrophe in terms of a lot of people actually not even getting food or shelter. So I think it's been harder for us here on that front, although the virus doesn't seem to be so virulent yet here. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. But yeah, to answer your question, I think it's a bit of both. That's what I would say. Um, uh, Carolyn, you, you, you shaped the, the, or you coined the, 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 the phrase uh, poetry of witness. Do you feel yourself in the position of being a witness of, of something now, or is it something basically that, that makes you uh, just, just stay without the words? About me? No, no, Carolyn. <laughs> Carolyn, <laughs> Carolyn, please. <laughs> uh, I would say that uh, the poetry of witness was um, a, a way of reading poems written in the aftermath of extremity. Uh, and that extremity was collectively born or inflicted by the state. So I collected the works of poets who had endured warfare, um, house arrest, imprisonment, exile. And what, what interested me about it was that the work and the language itself was marked by these experiences. What occurs to me now is that all of humanity is, is being transformed in consciousness by an experience we are collectively having for the first time in the sense that we are all, to, we are all able to communicate with each other. This is happening to us, not as members of particular nation states or nationalities, but as a species. And I think we're all being marked right now by this experience and our language will bear that mark in the future. In answer to your your other question, I think in the beginning there was shock, uh, a kind of numbness, uh, uh, wondering what we should do. And then there was a, a, a strange, I experienced a kind of distraction, uh, a kind of sometimes I would sleep at odd hours, have strange dreams. I found out other people were doing the same thing. Other people were having these dreams, other people's sleep had been disrupted. Um, and we were, for the first time, even though we were all collectively experiencing the same thing, we are all isolated, uh, away from each other. We're deprived of presence. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, we have a measure of solitude we didn't have before, and perhaps that can bring with it a, a certain kind of peace and awareness uh, and access to our inner being so that we can write. But at the same time, we're suppressed by a worry, concern for others, fear, wondering when we'll be able to emerge again. And I also think it's given us a real appreciation for what it really meant to be together, to be mm -hmm. able to be together. Mm -hmm. I see, just, uh, just to reply a, a bit, I see it also from the, from the organizers' point of view of the many organizers of literary events, how, how much they truly miss what they've been doing for a number of years and how uh, how much hope they put basically in now new forms that develop all over the world basically in the net although we all know this cannot be a true substitute not on the long run for for uh, what we shared before uh, leon you've been um, of course in in touch with the with the chinese uh, reality and probably much better uh, informed than all of us uh, already when uh, the virus broke out in wuhan uh, and probably now you also see how um, uh, uh, already the aftermath of 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 the times of the virus which is being quite controlled in in, in china did did this make you write or react in any way? Well, I must just say, uh, the, the firstly, hope or hopeless uh, is a very traditional Chinese topic, which is a way have been experienced that almost since, let's say, ancient time, thousands years ago, and especially the recent uh, history, and it's always 
uh, fighting inside of this crazy storm. But number two is this is special situation today, like uh, uh, the, uh, well, link with the virus, but far more than only the virus, politically, culturally, socially, and uh, starting from Wuhan, and uh, the first place in the world isolated the whole uh, city. And, uh, and then the people uh, experienced, let's say directly, what's the mean of jail, you know? And it's not only the prisoners in jail, but everyone is in the jail. And uh, that was the terrible experience. And uh, then, uh, of course, uh, it's a beginning from uh, Wuhan and China, but soon now becoming a global situation and everyone directly experienced the reality which Chinese people experienced for so long. And, uh, and at this time, one very, very interesting thing happened because all people in Wuhan and in China has to stay in home and not allowed to go out of the door. And uh, suddenly the language, the writing, becoming extremely important, is millions and billions of people have been waiting until the middle night and for the two writers who live in Wuhan and they wrote their diaries and directly talk about their first hand of experience uh, of the life. And, uh, and they, because they talk differently from the, any kind of official uh, media, and, uh, and uh, therefore, the people share and uh, exchange their, their feelings with them so, um, let's say, deeply. And, uh, and this, this uh, uh, passion about uh, their writings was uh, unbelievable. And uh, uh, one of the writers called uh, Xiao, Xiao Yin, and he is a poet. And therefore, because he writes poetry, so his feeling was very much down to earth, very sincerely, and, uh, and uh, the way of writing was a very um, subtle, no propaganda feeling, no such thing, but very detailed into the life. And uh, that's, I have to say, it's almost like a, a poetry, but in the prose form. Uh, mm -hmm. After sometimes in start from the February, our magazine Survivors Poetry magazine published the last issue, especially focused at the virus. And mm -hmm. I, as the chief editor, I uh, especially recommended Xiao Yin's poems as a poet, and uh, therefore to show how the poetry actually leads his prose writing. And uh, now a um, huge number of the poetry and the prose and essays uh, been created based on the trouble. And, uh, and uh, also we see how this trouble now becoming a global situation and how the world in a very dark way, but united together directly uh, with this situation. So I'm sure the hope is actually came out from this hopeless situation. That's a very good point that you're making. We called um, our festival Festival of Hope just because of that reason. Uh, since we truly believe that poetry and artistic expression does matter even more in times of, of severe crisis, we are, in, I think, probably globally in a very strange situation due to the pandemic. Much less books are being produced as normally. On the other hand, much more books are being read, not just because people are locked in their homes, but also because there is a deep search, I think, a, a, a communal search among most of us for uh, specific answers or at least some uh, firm ground beneath our feet that uh, seem to be missing uh, quite many times in the last decades. So um, if, we, if we write, if we react, is it in times like this, 
is it connected at least for you in your own let's say uh, philosophy of writing is it connected with uh, a gesture of of hope i mean when we speak about hope we usually at least in europe we we connect it to the greek myths to pandora to uh, uh, the jar uh, out of which um, uh, all the 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 bad uh, stuff was released among uh, humans also um, um, also uh, illnesses but then the jar was was closed sealed again and hope stayed uh, at the bottom is it basically what um, you personally feel as something uh, you would you would like to reach out in this moment or you would say perhaps that it's rather our act of resistance if you would if you uh find yourself in in the position to be creative these days well i myself just wrote one poem uh linked with this very situation and within the poem there is a one question a little bit of philosophically what is the death? Is the death cut us off or link us together? And that is a very, uh, let's say, extreme uh, question about uh, our situation now. Uh, and I think that's really the, um, the point of this uh, situation today. Because the, uh, well, we talked about the poetry festival as well, because we both uh, we all have been so many festivals, but let's say for all those poetry festivals, they have a one darker side, which is uh, normally our so-called professional poets are there, and uh, some audience who love poetry are there, but nothing to do with most of other people. But what's the poetry today to me is the poetry is happening in the everyone's life and the mind. And this life and the death, which is normally the theme of poetry uh, to deal, but now it's been pushed and pushed at so directly in front of everybody's eyes and mm. everybody's heart. And what do you feel and think about that? I think in one the human being everybody has to thinking her or his situation like this and they give a great ground of poetry to grow and i think that's what uh, the important thing maybe we could call hope mm -hmm. caroline what would you say is it an act of hope poetry these days We can't hear you. We can't. We can't hear you. No. Manlio Argueta, the Salvadoran uh, novelist, wrote, hope also nourishes us, not the hope of fools, the other kind. Hope mm. when everything is clear, awareness. So for him, hope is awareness. Hope is clarity. Hope is finally coming to a measure of understanding about what life really means and, and what is at stake and who we are uh, as human beings. As Liam was saying, um, it, it is a life and death issue now. So we're coming awake, I think. And that's a hopeful thing. As for poetry, Bertolt Brecht was asked um, about that, about whether poetry would survive dark times. And of course, he said, in, they, they said, in the dark times, will there also be singing yes there will be singing about the dark times mm -hmm. so I, I think people turn to poetry in times like this um, not only to to read it to write it to listen to it to think about it more than in other times and it might be because it's probably our oldest art form and it's the only one made out of nothing but our own language our own creation and so people are returning to that deeply inside themselves, I think now. I was facing this phenomenon uh, twice. 
in the Yugoslav wars and in times of uh, severe economic crisis, uh, 2007, eight, when the book sales fell dramatically, at least in Slovenia, uh, of all books, a part of poetry books. So, uh, uh, so you could really see that people were turning to the poets to, 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 to listen to them, at least part of the people turned to the poets in times of severe crisis. I think perhaps it's also a question of, of belief. Whom do I believe in dark times? Sharmista, what do you think? Um, I don't know. I, I would first like to say that that's, you know, it's very beautiful what uh, Leon said, because I hadn't thought of it like that, that actually humanity seems to have come together because of a force of darkness rather than a force of light. I mean, force of light hasn't seemed to be able to have brought us together, but this has. And that is quite an amazing thing to me. Um, as far as the role of poetry, Alash, and hope, I think, you know, what Carolyn is saying, I agree with it. I think that I would add something a little more to it, which is that we, as poets, as, you know, human beings, must also think about uh, how we've treated the world. And we must also think about other ways of approaching life. You know, not just, um, you know, to me, hope is in a way to become more lean, you know, less kind of a centripetal force, uh, so to speak, rather than a centri centrifugal force that we seem to be living by, to do less, not more. And to make, to step back and maybe make a less homogenized world, which, you know, in a way, poetry is directly related to. Right now, we have a world which is, you know, even the most traditional, older, past driven places you know, kind of define themselves in relation to the centers of the world and to centers of power, to globalization, you know. And I think that people need to step back from that, to look at uh, the fact that each culture has its own understanding of what knowledge is. Knowledge is not just science, it's not just textual. I mean, as you know, in India, we have a vast array of other knowledge systems, which somehow are still alive. So in, in each culture, at least, I suppose in non-Western cultures, those things are alive. And I think that poetry, in those cultures at least, needs to draw from that, is drawing from that. And the world does need to look at reaching out to things which are not supposedly also universal. I think there is a great ambivalence in our feelings right now. On one hand, we see this unifying force that, uh, as Carolyn put it so beautifully, really connects us, creates a community, uh, a global community in a way that nothing did before, ever before in human history. On the other hand, uh, there is great fear of the future. Uh, and there is, um, there are so many personal and other theories, what will happen tomorrow with this communal experience, how we can treat it. And what we try to do also with the festival that will start basically to, tomorrow um, is to, to, to make a small gesture, the small gesture to say, look how much beauty, how much creativity and how much seeking for, for truth and for, for the right thing there is out there. You have just to to, to have a glimpse into this vast universe, uh, whether be it through, through the net or, or in any other way. Uh, at, uh, before we started this conversation, I was asking you if you could prepare uh, each of you a, a text, a poem of yours to, to be read, because uh, I think that's, that's also what uh, the, 
a big majority of our uh, viewers and listeners is is here for to hear your work uh, 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 to be to be read uh, in presence. Please, who would like to start? Um, Sharmista, would you like to start, please? Sure. Bring us near, nearer, not further far. Take us close, closer, unbuild us to soil, gravel, mud. Fold back the excess of cloth so we may weave again, unmake us. A nocturnal sorrow opens over the great river plains. The falcon with a single wing flies alongside. Move us from unfire to fire. Return stone to the mountains. Unfirm us. The alcoholic stoops low on his plastic stool in the middle of the precarious alleyway. Unsure our voices so we can listen sometimes. Make us many, the not one, and only then make us one, the not two. Take us away from calculations so there remains only near and distant, high and low, early and late, the front and the back and the four directions. Thank you very much, Sharmista. Perhaps you can tell just uh, two, three words um, uh, connected to the poem. Uh, where, where did it appear? And if there is a story attached to it. Um, you know, Alesh, these poems were writ I began writing them about three years ago in this new book, and they're um, very hard to put it into words, you know. Uh, it's there in the poem. I think there's a need in me, as I said earlier, to kind of become leaner, to get to the most fundamental things. Um, I was also partly influenced in writing these poems um, by some very old texts in the Indian tradition, namely the Rig Veda, which is the very, very first text that we have in our, in our civilization, and it's from about 1500 BC. Um, and I felt the need to go back to very elemental things and look at life from there. Mm -hmm. This connects very much also to the present. I've asked everyone to share something that has at least some notion of hope in yeah. it. Not to illustrate hope, of course, that would be uh, inappropriate, but, uh, but to have a sensation and we could feel it uh, very much there. Thank you very much for your reading, Sharmista. Um, Thank you. Carolyn, Carolyn, can I ask you to to share with, with us one of your poems. Yes, um, this poem, I'll tell you the history of it after I read it, but it's called What Comes, and it begins with an epigraph by the French resistance poet René Chal. What Comes. I brought from despair a basket so small, my love, that it might have been woven of willow, René Chal. To speak is not yet to have spoken, the not yet of a white realm of nothing left, neither for itself nor another, a no longer already there, along with the arrival of what has been, light and the reverse of light, terror as walking blind along the breaking sea, body in whom I lived, the not yet of death, darkening what it briefly illuminates, an unknown place as between languages, back and forth, breath to breath, as a calm in the surround rises, fireflies in lindens, an ache of pine, you have yourself within you, 
yourself, you have her, and there is nothing that cannot be seen. Open then to the coming of what comes. Thank you. Um, the poem was written uh, at a time when I was um, having chemotherapy and at a time when I didn't know whether I would live or not. And it was, in a sense, uh, a poem to reassure myself. Um, and so I chose it to read today because in some ways, uh, I think we're all experiencing a glimmer of that feeling. So I wanted to reassure us. <laughs> beautiful. It's, it's uh, very beautiful. Um, listening to it, I had to think about the, the melting cynicism that's in the world, uh, especially in the arts world. We are surrounded usually by, by cynicism, by, by very sharp irony that um, has a, very often a main goal not to disclose but to destroy. And of course now, since everyone is in one's jail, one's isolation, one's solitude, um, there is much less reason to be cynical, but to be very much open to very basic questions. And this gives back power to poetry very often. Uh, I know of people who, who haven't read poetry for decades probably. They are reading uh, poetry and listening to poets uh, now, and I hope they will keep on doing. Uh, Leon, uh, could we have your poem, please? But my case, uh, my case is a bit more difficult because I never read my poems in my young English. Uh, I mean, because uh, it's so difficult to uh, read the musical, uh, musically out of the, the same poems, different from my own tongue. Uh, so I will read this poem in my Chinese. But may I just introduce a little, little bit uh, this poem is titled uh, Sunflower Seeds Lines of Negation and uh, uh, dedicated to the Chinese artist uh, Ai Weiwei. Uh, and because he is a Chinese artist, but he's also doing something socially and politically. And once he, was been, he had been put into jail because he went to uh, um, checking why so many school buildings was clogged in Sichuan and uh, more than 5,000 kids was killed. And, uh, but he got the uh, trouble with the local authorities and then he was being put in the, in the jail. Uh, and then the, well, the poem was written when he was in jail because uh, the title is uh, uh, based on an installation and he made, it's called Sunflower Seeds. There were 150 tons of sunflower seeds, uh, but all made uh, by the uh, porcelain and hand painted. And that's like a huge installation. And this poem actually is uh, turned himself as one of the sunflower seeds and uh, speak out. And all poems, every sentence, in the form of negation until the very last line, um, refusing to light this, uh, refusing to let the poem sink into that indifferent beauty. That means I hope poetry keeping the soul <laughs> and warm blood. Uh, within the self. And uh, I learned uh, from all the, uh, the, the poets, um, which is the life experience, everything we experience actually lead us to understand of the writing and, uh, and uh, whatever big or small things. So uh, in that case, I think we are 
in the way of thinking of poetry, we are so close and exactly the same, almost. So I'll read a poem. I hope you will get the translation later uh, from our program. Yeah. 一粒葵花籽的否定句我不是象征一场地震不会停止不落进泥土只落进流不动的江水中不在乎石头含着的金黄得继续含着向地杜甫的老泪不让这首诗沉沦为冷漠死寂的美 That's a poem Thank you very much, dear Liam Thank you very much. We will uh, subtitle it so every, 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 all the viewers will also be able to, to understand it. I also uh, brought a very uh, sh short poem in, in Slovenia. I'll read it to all of you. There is no special story behind it. It's from a rather old book now already, but um, uh, I'm struggling between moments of uh, great hope and anticipation and the feeling that i'm here i have to do something now something not for me for the community for uh, all, all the all the people i i feel connected to and i got so much uh, and i would love to return it in those days even more than before and then there is this other side of me who is speaking perhaps this kind of of thoughts Človek je senca, ki jo črka meče, črka gre vse posod, senca ne zapusti votline. A person is a shadow thrown by a letter. The letter goes everywhere. The shadow doesn't leave the cave. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, with a philosophical, let's say, uh, small thought. Besides of asking you, asking you uh, to prepare a poem, uh, I kindly ask you also to prepare um, excerpts or sh uh, short poems uh, written by others or ideas, uh, thoughts uh, on the theme of hope. And to conclude our our session, our opening session of the festival of hope. I'd like I'd like to ask you perhaps to to read one or two of those and to comment a bit to uh, to explain what made you choosing just these ideas and how do you feel connected in any way with them? Leon, would you start? Well, actually, I have uh, two choices, and uh, but uh, um, well, one from ancient Chinese in the Tang Dynasty. That's uh, also a very uh, famous poet called Bai Juyi, Bai Juyi. And he has one poem uh, which titled in English is uh, saying goodbye among the grasses on the ancient plain. 
Uh, mm. It's a goodbye female uh, poem, but the, the two lines in the poems are so famous in China because that, re, uh, let's say, represent this uh, hope which you never, uh, you, you, you can um, always keep in your hand. Is again, like classical Chinese poetry, it's using the natural uh, images and to explain that feeling. The two lines in Chinese is like, Ye huo shao bu jin, chun feng chui yu sheng. And, uh, and the, the translation, which I, I urgently asked my uh, English translator, Brian Houghton, made the translation because he's talking about the grasses and call it uh, something like that. Wild fires wouldn't, 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 will not burn the grass, uh, burn them up for spring breezes, wind will blow and the grasses will rise again. Mm. The wild grass, the uh, wild fires will never burn up the grasses because when the spring winds come and the grasses will rise again. And this always gives the people a kind of a symbol of hope, which mm. in the very uh, hopeless situation, because when the wild fires burn everything it seems everything is dead but again when the spring coming and the green came back again so uh, it's chinese people for more than 1200 years using this two sentence to support each other when the people meet the difficulties in the country in the family in the self and the, believe or hope the grass will turn to green again. And this is one poem. And secondly, I uh, myself, because um, I have been ex uh, exiled for uh, quite a long time, since 1989. So that's one important reference as China and uh, as myself, Russia, the poets from the Soviet uh, Union. And so Osip uh, Mendelssohn was one of the poet had been put in the desperate, desperately uh, hopeless situation. But at uh, one of the, uh, in the almost the last uh, year uh, or last two years of his life, 1937, 1938, he wrote so many poems and uh, terrible, uh, described the life in a terrible way, but again, keeping the hope, uh, the light of hope in the poem. Uh, this poem I find it's only in uh, English translation and the Chinese translation. I didn't really uh, find the Russian uh, original yet, but I will send to you and you will find it. In the English, it's uh, roughly like the ranks of human heads drawn though they are far away. Uh, well, this is again the 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 uh, the images like the human heads is uh, list there and uh, like a long endless line and uh, uh, moving too far away. And I am myself is a one of them. Again, one had been forgotten. But within the loving words, I will rise again to say the sun. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in this, again, the total situation, but poets in the, uh, within the um, energy of writing, an energy of creativities, and uh, actually is still believe the sun, like the ancient Chinese poet. I think after all, the sun is not somewhere else, but sun is inside of the poet himself. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's the, that's the nice point for all of us. Hmm. Thank you very much, Lee, and thank you to Berlin to share 
share uh, these wonderful poems and thoughts with us. Sharmista, uh, what did you pick? Um, Elish, I have two very brief poems. One is Falling to Hope and it's just about poetry. So I just quickly read you both. Um, one is, uh, the first one is from a 12th century poet called Basavanna. And this is a translation from the Indian language Kannada. Mm -hmm. The rich will make temples for Shiva. What shall I, a poor man, do? My legs are pillars, the body, the shrine, the head, a cupola of gold. Listen, O Lord of the meeting rivers. Things standing shall fall. The moving ever shall stay. And then this is just about poetry, but it's so beautiful when I was looking for something to read. Um, this is from the 18th century, a very old poet called Tukaram. To arrange words in some order is not the same thing as the inner poise that's poetry. The truth of poetry is the truth of being. It's an experience of truth. No ornaments survive a crucible. Fire reveals only molten gold. We are here to reveal. We do not waste words. It's absolutely beautiful, Sharmista. Thank um, you. I know, I bet. Two of my favorite poems, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for sharing this and, and also your thoughts from Mumbai. Carolyn. I'd like to uh, share a poem I have from memory. And like uh, Leon, I chose someone from the former Soviet Union, the great poet Anna Akhmatova. Mm -hmm. I've always been inspired by her, the preface to her poem Requiem. Uh, because it speaks to the possibility of poetry, especially in times as challenging as hers were and as ours are now. As, um, in, she's speaking in this poem about the experience of trying to bring provisions to her son who was in prison. Uh, and so the poem is, in the terrible years of the Yesov terror, I spent 17 months waiting in line outside a prison in Leningrad. One day, somebody recognized me. Standing behind me was a woman, her face blue from the cold, who had, of course, never heard me called by name before. Now she started out of the torpor common to us all and asked me in a whisper. Everyone whispered there. Can you describe this? And I said, I can. And something like a smile passed fleetingly over what had once been her face. Um, the, the other thing I share is by a monk, Thomas Merton, who is also a poet. Uh, and he lived a secluded life in a Trappist monastery, as we are all secluded now. And he has something to say about it, about that. This is a statement of his. At the corner of Fourth and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. If only everybody could realize this, but it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around, shining like the sun. <laughs> Very beautiful. Very beautiful. Thank you very, very much, Carolyn. 
um, I was I was trying to do the same. I typed in uh, and googled uh, hope quotes, and I've got millions of quotes <laughs> about hope. So, uh, I, I felt like completely polluted by by quotes about hope. I, I have a couple of very strange ones here. Um, one by Aristotle: Hope is a waking dream. Or Francis Bacon, the philosopher, hope is a good breakfast, but it is a bad supper. <laughs> or, or a Shakespearean one, the miserable have no other medicine but only hope. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, one can, uh, one can very hardly connect to this kind of hopeless hope uh, quotes <laughs> in our times what uh, where i really can connect is is at least for me and many many probably also of, of you all know it and all uh, many of our viewers will know it is for me the ultimate hope poem by emily dickinson who was leading a very secluded life uh, the way we are secluded and um this seclusion is also now, and this seclusion also made our conversation tonight possible. And uh, I'd like to thank you from all uh, my heart for, for joining and for sharing your wonderful work and your um, very intriguing ideas with us, uh, celebrating hope and I hope a much more brighter future for, for everyone. Let me finish, perhaps, with just this first Thank line. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. For, uh, first lines by Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Thank you one more time and uh, stay with us in the next week and what will follow after. There are over 50 international poetry festivals from around the world and other literary institutions that have joined our efforts to say that poetry is hope and there is hope and i hope that we will <laughs> see each other we hope all the best thank you thank you alesh thank you Bye -bye. thank you Carl. Bye. thank you Shami. Okay.